Next, we have vertpose. We're going to be talking about spinal stenosis with Dr. Krupp. Hi, Lisa. Hi. How are you? Hi, AJ. How you doing? Good, good. I'm going to shimmy over. I'm going to have your ear. Right. How are you? Hi, Scott. Good. Thanks for having me. So, tell us a little bit about uh, vertos and uh, this percutaneous approach. Yes. So, we saved the best for last year. I'm going to take this. And we'll be talking about the mild or piled procedure, which is percutaneous lumbar decompression. Um, this procedure has been really disruptive of the space. We have um, really thrown a wrench in what the historical way that we treated lumbar stenosis, which was with a laminectomy, which is a surgical procedure, and often patients might be recovering for 12 months. This is a very elegant, minimally invasive procedure that debulks the ligament in the posterior aspect of the spine. It's very safe. It's efficacious. Patients do great. Uh, I've had tremendous results in my practice. Um, and they're within a couple days, sometimes the next day, they're walking back totally back to normal. So um, we'll just move on here. So essentially, I think if you take nothing else away from what you're learning today is that you need to look at those MRIs, right? And when you're looking at your own uh, patient's MRIs, start looking for the ligament. That was something that was really brought to my attention because that ligament is hypertrophied in a really significant portion of our patients. And so, um, and so that's kind of the tagline here, look for the ligament. The way that these patients present is really pretty typical and textbook classic. They will complain of pain or numbness, tingling, weakness, maybe even heaviness or tired legs. That's typically what it is. And the symptoms are in the buttocks down to the legs. When they're standing and walking, you'll often see them sort of, you know, hunched over their walker or their cane. This very pathognomonic shopping cart sign is very typical. Patients will say, that's me. I'm holding on to the grocery cart at Costco. Um, and that pain is there when they're standing. And as soon as they sit down, it goes away. So it's very pretty typical. That's going to be your best candidate for this procedure with those symptoms of neurogenic claudication. So, um, and the bottom of the screen, we're looking at some cuts of the MRI. Um, the left side is that axial cut in green. The ligament is outlined, and you can see that it is thickened or hypertrophied. The um, indication for the procedure is 2.5 millimeter measurement of thickening of that ligament or greater. And so you really do need to look at those images and measure them yourself, at least when you're starting out. Um, um, up to 85% of spinal canal narrowing can be caused by that hypertrophy ligament right there. So as I said, it is very common. And when you start looking for it, you're going to see it in the majority of your patients with back pain and leg pain. Um, on the right side, you can see the sagittal view. Uh, it's sort of the ligaments covered up with those blue circles, but that's where you'll see the narrowing. You see that hourglass shape that, um, that is created by the ligament in the posterior the disc anterior sometimes, especially on this um, image that we're looking at here. And then you also have a third component, was, which is facet joint arthropathy. Those three things come together and they squeeze the, sp the spinal nerves. And that's what creates those symptoms in the lower extremities. Um, this slide is showing us uh, basically the technique. Uh, very simply, it's a um, very small incision that's made. So healing is really quick. The patients have minimal post-operative pain. I tell patients that the size of the incision is like my baby finger. Um, there's two primary surgical instruments that we use. One is a bone runger. That debulks where the ligament is attached to the bone on the lamina. You pull off tiny pieces of lamina. That's the laminectomy part of this. And then you use the tissue sculptor to go and clean out what is left. Um, and most physicians will put a uh, stereo strip on there to cover up the incision. Um, like everything we do in medicine, we have to have a basis in, um, in science and have good level one data. So MILD has two studies, um, randomly controlled trials, uh, right, sorry, randomized controlled trials, RCTs, multi-center studies um, that showed two primary things. One was really significant functional improvement um, the second was significant reduction in pain scores. Um, and we're looking at that data and those patients up to five years, and we're still seeing that 88% uh, of patients have avoided having to go on and have a back surgery. They have 
reduce their symptoms, and improve their physical function with this very simple, minimally invasive procedure. Um, the safety profile is excellent. It's the same as an epidural steroid injection. There is a component of this procedure in which uh, many physicians will do an epiduralgram to be able to outline the epidural space and see where the ligament is thickened. That, if you choose to do that, would be the most, um, the highest risk part of the procedure. So it's very low risk and efficacious is what we have seen. Um, this is this Midas Encore study, a two-year follow-up. Again, as I said, significant improvement, statistically significant improvement in ODI, so reduction of disability, functioning at a higher level, walking more. These patients are typically at baseline, very deconditioned, debilitated. They have poor mobility. They may only be taking a few steps to go to the bathroom at home. Um, and we're seeing really significant up to two to three times improvement in their mobility, their walking, getting around, and much less pain. Um, this slide talks about the different comorbidities. So the foraminal stenosis, the, um, the facet joint hypertrophy, degenerative disc disease, all of these things that go hand in hand with ligamentum platelet hypertrophy. Um, and we see a combination of those conditions or pathologies in the patients we're treating. Spondylolisthesis can be present as well, not as common, and as long as it is not higher than a grade two, uh, these patients are still having phenomenal outcomes and are a no-brainer to go ahead and do this procedure. So if I see a patient with those symptoms of that pain in the buttocks, legs, tiredness, weakness, sometimes they don't even report pain, it's just a heaviness. Um, and they and, and they're feeling that when they get up and they sit down, they're like, nope, I'm great, I'm great when I sit down, I bend forward, nothing hurts. They're standing like this when you're examining them, um, and they have a thickened ligament on MRI, my first line is mild. That's what I do because those patients do great. So I was going to ask you that question. Uh, you know, since you've been doing the mild procedure, do you do epidural steroid injections for patients with spinal stenosis, or did you just go straight to this? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, it really depends on the patient, right? And I like to give patients options. I think that's one thing in pain management. We have such a variety of different procedures that we can now offer that are evidence-based. Um, epidural steroid injections don't have a ton of evidence to support long-term relief. So I may offer it as a short-term relief if we maybe need to get a prior approval, something like that, or the patient's never had an epidural. Those are the patients that, and, and they may you know, just want to try an epidural before we do anything else. And I think, you know, sometimes we see epidurals lasting for years, right? So, but often they're short term and then um, we may do, I may do one or two epidurals and then move on to mild, but it, this comes much sooner in the algorithm now. And it is something that I will discuss with that patient with that stenosis, especially if they have those pathomonic symptoms because those people just do so well. Yeah, I think it's interesting about, you're not going to get a patient who has just a hypertrophic ligament. And looking for that perfect patient with central canal stenosis, only hypertrophic ligament flavum, you're just not gonna find it. These patients come with all these other degenerative changes. And so using this tool in someone with multifactorial stenosis is appropriate. And sometimes that's all you need to do is just take out a little bit of that ligament and that's enough room for them to feel better and get more function. Absolutely. Yeah, it can make such a difference. Um, and we do see those different pathologies. They go hand in hand. It starts with the degenerative disc disease and then they develop that thickening of the ligament. And I will show patients on their MRI those three things that contribute to stenosis. And I will say the thing, especially if they have those symptoms, again, those neurogenic claudication symptoms, mild is the procedure that's going, that is most likely going to help reduce those symptoms. If it's axial low back pain, we may be thinking a different direction. Right. Um, I don't personally do anything for discs. I don't do any minimally visit discectomies. So that's an anterior um, component and it, it, there's higher risk there, right? There's right. just more risk with some of those other things. So we want to do the lowest risk, most efficacious thing that has the most durability. And that's where mild comes in. And it's honestly been um, really a game changer. That's great. Yeah, that's great. So how do we get started? Okay, so um, I like to mark things out, especially if I'm teaching something and how to use this. And so um, what I'll do is we'll 
what we're going to first do, well, let's, let's step back a moment. So the first thing we have to do is position the patient on the table. And we like to use a couple of rolled towels under their belly to round out that lordosis. Um, that really will make quite a difference in having a successful procedure. And then we get our serum lined up. Um, and we're probably going to look at that. So we've decided with our pre-surgical planning what level we're going to do, but today we're going to look at L4-5 on the left side here. And so uh, there are some, uh, this cadaver is actually very osteophytic, so we will um, work around that. So that's one thing you have to consider when you're looking at the imaging too, is how, whether or not you may be able to access, if somebody has really, really severe lateral recess or primal sclerosis, it is possible that you may not get a great access, but these tools are really good for 99.9% you know, .9 of patients. So um, what I do is I'll look at with Kelly or anything, right? So I will um, you know, put a marker on here and, if we're going to start at L4-5, which I'll just point to that just for uh, our purposes here. So it's L4-5. So what we want to do is start about one and a half levels below. So I start around S1, maybe a little bit below S1 over here, and I'm in the, or in the midline of the picture. All right, so this is going to be my starting point around right there. So I'm going to anesthetize. I do a stab incision like we talked about, right? So stab incision. And then what I'll do is I will I will numb up the track. And I'm going to show you. So one way to do this here is just to um, put in a finer needle right at this level. Um, for the purposes of what we're doing today, we are not going to do an epidurogram. Um, but you may consider that as far as when you're starting out. I think it does give you a really nice visualization of where that ligament is. Um, the safety, all the safety areas where your VLL is, where, you know, the area you want to stay in so as not to create, uh, not to create any uh, issues. So, um, so I just showed you that. So I'm, that, that's what I'm going to follow, really, that track. Um, and I didn't talk about, this is the cannula with a trocar. And so this has a bevel tip, and it really is pretty, it, it goes in pretty easily. It's fairly sharp, so you do have to just go slow. And I think when you're starting any kind of new procedure, just slow is, as they say, slow is slow and steady. Slow is steady. Steady take is fast. AP, take obliques, right. take get laterals, get views. comfortable. So I'm going to actually move this out of our way, but essentially that's that. And then I'm pretty happy with that positioning here. You know, I want to be pointing a little bit more toward the midline, but I'm essentially on the lamina right next to the spinous process, um, and I am pointed toward the um, intralaminar space. So at this point, the very cool thing about this procedure is we can go into a contralateral oblique view, um, and that's going to give us just a really nice picture of those lamina. We want them to look like sails. And I like how you prep with the needle. You know, you know your target. You know your entry of angle. Makes it easier. Let's let you numb the whole tract up yeah. so it's really comfortable. Yeah. Because you don't need a lot of sedation in these cases. You really don't. I've I've done these interlocal. Yes. Um. So now that we're in this view, you know we're gonna put. So I have to kind of steepen the angle here a bit. What I want to do is come onto that lamina below. Um, we can oblique slightly more toward you. I'm gonna see it just briefly. See if we can get a little better image. Um, I think that's okay. And so essentially I'm here between the L4 and L5 lamina. Now one thing I probably will do at this point is just get an AP, make sure I like where I am. I don't love that inferior lamina, but for our purposes today we're going to go with it. And once you start doing these cases you can get comfortable with contralateral mm -hmm. lateral oblique. Yeah. I feel like you start yeah. using that view for a lot of different things. For a ton of things. Yeah. And, and we talked about this earlier today, using that view for your epidurals. So we look like we're in the right space here. There's our AP. So I'm still sort of, so I like this because I'm still a bit lateral here. As you guys can see, I, I want to, and I'm going to hold this thing so we're going more medial, but um, I really want that to be a little more medial like that. Otherwise, I'm going to end up kind of in the facet joint or not, or in the foramen. Okay, so let's go back to that contralateral oblique view. Um, so use your epidurogram. I would say during your epidural. So if you do are doing an epidural before you bring the patient in for mild, um, use that as your pre-surgical planning. So that way you can see, you, you kind of know where things are, you take some images, 
Um, so we are not used to doing this contralateral oblique with epidurals, most people, but I think it's a good good rule, and Absolutely. I do that a lot. So let's um, okay, good. excellent radiation. Okay, so now what I put on here is called the stabilizer. I think you guys can see the top of that. That just holds things in place. It's a nice little rest for your hand. And we've got the depth gauge. So this is dialed into 15 millimeters. That makes sure that we don't go too deep when we start off. Um, and then I take my bone runger. So as a physiatrist, I never thought I'd be using a bone runger. <laughs> right. right, so this was a new one for me. Um, and I think seeing other, you know, seeing my colleagues doing this, especially female colleagues, and this is a Whitcomb event, that's what motivated me to be interested in doing this procedure and feel confident that I can do it. So as you can see, so I was a little bit lateral, right? As you remember when we looked at the AP, so I'm angling myself. I didn't, we, we can draw this out. I didn't draw it out today, but um, if there's any issue, I will. So I'm just door knobbing this in and then I'll get, you know, quite a few pictures here because I want to see where I am while I'm getting my depth. And that's, a little deeper than I want to be, but we're still fine. So at this point, I'm going to go up like this when I'm pulling because I am on the edge of that lamina, a superior aspect. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, here, can you go live for a second? I'm going to go like that, off, and then I'm going to pull that out. So as you can see, I don't know where our camera is, but um, we got a nice little chunk, really nice chunk of ligament there. So can we see this under here? Ta-da. Okay. So that always makes me happy. We know we're in the right area, we're making, making a dent. So I, I can do a number of passes there. I probably would do three there. And then what I would do is start to just pull the cannula back a little bit so that I can go up to that superior lamina. And again, I, I still want to be pointing toward midline because I don't want to be in that foramen. If I'm too lateral, I, I can kind of irritate those nerve roots and the patient is going to be calling me and not happy after this. So. And again, we're gonna doorknob that in, picture, okay, picture. So, and this is one where, again, your positioning is gonna be really important um, because you're gonna to start to push down on the buttock here. So the more you can get the back rounded, the easier it's gonna to be to get up in that space. So I'm really pushing down here and I'm just taking my time and I'm just kind of, what I'm doing is dialing down this depth gauge. Um, as I'm door knobbing the bone runger into place, I have my left hand or my non-dominant hand right here on the stabilizer. It does exactly what the name says. It stabilizes all of your instruments so that you don't sort of just push this into the canal. Um, and so I like this positioning here. I am going to now again take my bite. I won't show you in live, but it's the same thing. Take another picture there. You know, I just took a bite and then I'm going to pull it out. So the angles are really important as you're doing this. Um, and if you don't come in at the right angle, you can always reposition, but that's going to be really important. And those steps that you showed are super important to making that canal so you can get your sculptor in really easily. If you do a good exactly. job there, the next step is a lot easier. Super easy. Wow, 100%. And what we'll show you is where this is. So again, I am sort of pushing this more medial, um, just so I want to make sure I'm in there. And I, again, I will pull my cannula back a little bit because I made the advance, but I'm just going down to basically the second hash line there. Picture. So that's where I want to be. And what I'll do is just um, to get an AP view so we can see where we are. I just want you guys to feel comfortable going back and forth from AP to contralateral oblique. You don't need a lateral with this, which is cool. So it's pretty quick. You don't have to bother with um, doing that as you won't see it. You won't see as well in that view. So we're pointed toward the midline here. I like this um, image. So I'm gonna go back to my contralateral oblique. And then um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna sorta, of, again, doorknob this. And I just hold this with my thumb and my third finger, and I'm gonna do this, because as I'll show you, this is my finger. This has a sharp, sort of sharp edge um, right there. And so as I go this way, it's helping me cut through that ligament. So not only am I kind of cutting it and detaching it, but then I'm also scooping it. So there's a little um, area in here that collects the ligament, okay? I think the scooping motion is one that's very different from everything else we do. I don't think we scoop anytime else. And yeah. so that motion of scooping is so important. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so this is the scooping. So you're turning and scooping. And so you just practice this, like practice this and scoop. So we will go through and you'll see that. 
Um, picture. There we go. Okay, so I like to be right. I'm going to start right there, and I'll go live on this one. You really should do these in live, but as you, uh, yeah, so I'm kind of pushing through. So I am um, okay. So I didn't quite. So that was a nice. I mean, we got a nice um, bite here. We got a nice bit of ligament. The one thing I would prefer to do is get a little bit higher up. So I'm just going to adjust my cannula here, down a bit, okay. and we'll go like this picture. And I'm actually, as you see, I'm keeping my hand on this picture. Picture. So it's a little steeper. We can get up um, under there, and then. Um, I didn't explain what I'm doing, but I actually got quite a bit more ligament because I'm really just trying to get up under that lamina. But um, here you can see that we got quite a bit. So all I'm doing when I'm in there, once I get into position, is I'm, do is I'm squeezing the trigger here. And you can squeeze it three times to fill it up. Sometimes I do more to get greedy. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, but we got quite a bit more ligament. And I will say some surgeons have gotten away from using the tissue sculptor which is okay, you develop your own style. However, uh, I find that I collect quite a bit of li ligament in that, and the bone wrencher help does its job, and the tissue sculptor does no, its I, job. I agree, I think, yeah. you know, you get more passes with this. With, with the bone wrencher, it, it's kind of annoying to have to take a bite and come out, and take a bite and come out. Right. So I love this, I can go in there and sculpt, and sculpt, and sculpt, and scoop out what I want to, without having to keep coming out. So I appreciate yeah, that. About it's, it's very more efficient. Yeah. Um, so that is pretty much what I would do. Now, if I was going to um, go up to, so I would make a few passes. I'd probably do three. I would actually keep passing the tissue sculptor until nothing, until I didn't have anything else coming out. Right? That was super smooth. That was yeah. really cool. Yeah. Uh, you, yeah if someone you know wants to learn, how do they get a hold of you guys? Where should they go from? Um, go to the website, vertosmed.com. Um, there's a lot of great resources on there, uh, physician finders, and as well as physicians that are interested in being trained. Uh, so we're always happy to hear from you guys when you need something. Yeah, great. That's great. One last thing I was going to show you. Absolutely. So um, if you can go north a little bit. So you actually, the really cool thing about this technique. Oh, yeah. Guys, help here. So the cool thing about this technique is you can do multiple levels at the same time. Um, and so if I want to go, so I'm at L4-5 picture, if I want to go to L3-4, I just come back, picture, and picture, and I can go, I might sometimes need to go back to the AP, but usually I can get in there. So now I'm at the next level, right? So I can go another level up and do that on the left side. I routinely do that for a, bio, uh, for a two level case. Yeah. Uh, it's super easy. It's less trauma to the patient. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. And, and I'll show one, one last thing. So in the AP view, I promise this is it. In the AP view, um, I didn't talk about this when I made the incision, but there's been a lot of debate between the standard technique and the streamlining technique. And what that means is where you put your incision. So when you have a nice straight spine like this one, meaning it's not severely scoliotic, you can get away with this. Can you come bring this guys up a little bit? Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay, picture. So here I am. I did this the standard technique. If I was going to do the streamline technique, I would go right here in the middle. Right? And so I have made an incision right there. Right here in the middle. And then what I could do is I can pull the tissue this way and go in, and I can also pull the tissue to the right and go in. So from one incision, I can do multiple levels bilateral, and that is that is why it's called streamlining. Very efficient. Very smooth. Yeah. Thanks again. That was yeah. great. Dr. Proof, really yeah. appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. So that was Vertos. That was the mild procedure. Uh, and uh, that was the last case of the day. So we're going to bring everybody in.